Cool. So um, I'd like to introduce the next speaker now. Um, this is uh, Ben Lupton. Um, he's been working in, in JavaScript for a really long time. Um, sounds like he's super experienced. Um, he runs a consultancy that does um, JavaScript and, and Node um, development. Um, I think um, you do a bunch of open source stuff, which yeah. is kind of used uh, quite widely, which is kind of cool. Um, uh, one of those is, is Docpad, which I believe is the one of the, uh, at least in part, the subject of his talk today. Um, so I give to you uh, Ben Lupton um, and the Rapid Web Development with Docpad. Cool. Hello, everybody. Um, so probably that was a good intro. I like that. Um, so probably to start off, um, to add on, so I'm Ben Lupton. I've been doing tons of open source stuff. Um, and of them, one of them is Docpad. And that's Docpad. And what it kind of allows you to do is you know create <laughs> node websites really really easy but it will generate a static website that you can deploy anywhere at the start so you can deploy it to Apache, GitHub pages, whatever you want. Now it will let you render Markdown, Jade, Haml, Stylus, SAS, PHP if you really want to do PHP and all, a whole bunch of other things as well. And I probably a good way to go about this talk I guess is like because of all the questions earlier I'll probably maybe be a bit more spontaneous with this talk um, and just like jump. So also feel free to jump in and ask questions whenever you want. I'll happily answer as well. Um, so my company's been doing consultancy for a long time in open source stuff. Some of the people that use our stuff are pretty big, which is good. Um, Microsoft used Docpad for one of their sites. 37 Signals use a different product. Docpad, Docpad, HistoryJS, Query Engine, which is used by Docpad and Query Engine as well. So some JavaScript projects, some Node projects. Um, you can see all our projects here. This website's live. And we've got all our documentation, everything here, and some stuff for Node and the different things. Now, Docpad came from my frustration with how long it was taking to actually get up and running with websites. Like, if I wanted to set up a simple blog, I had a install like a CMS system, install a database, make sure the database is working, get a web server that could actually handle that database and that server technology. And whenever I actually I wanted to do something that could break out of the box a little bit, like didn't follow the conventions that were set in place for that particular framework, I felt like I had to like go with machete in the jungle and like knock down that box or cut away the walls. Which frameworks are people using today here? Do we have Rails people or Django people? Or I always pronounce the D accidentally. So Django. Yeah. And Rails, how many people are Rails? So we got one. What, what does everybody use? OK. <laughs> so some .NET people. Um, <laughs> OK. Um, I did a little .NET like a long time ago. I, it confused me a little bit. Well, I like the C sharp. I like the desktop stuff, but not the .NET ASP side. It was confusing. Um, so yeah, like, I, it actually came because the story is quite funny. Because I was with um, another housemate, and we're in Germany. We're drinking no Switzerland. And we're drinking beer, and a lot of beer, and watching a lot of Breaking Bad at the same time. And he had the same problem. He was just like. How the hell do we get a website up and running real quickly? And at the time, there was a thing called Jekyll that came out by one of the GitHub guys. You get to create a static website, and we thought that was really nifty. But it couldn't get past a simple blog that well. It was quite constrained. So we're like, OK, let's rethink this and go at it with a straight mind and a kind of drunk mind as well, so a very ambitious mind. And we kind of thought, OK, do we really need all the stuff that is in a CMS? Do we need a database? We're not storing you know, thousands of records that need to be analyzed by like a mathematician. We're not actually storing data, we're storing content. And why do we have to use the crappy little WordPress um, interface, like the GUI, which like, you know, the RTF thing, when we actually, people write their blog posts actually on the local machine. They use Word, 
they use Markdown, they use little Sublime text, the TextMate, and then at the end you just like go copy and paste what you've done into the little crappy WordPress editor, right? So we moved on and we thought, okay, let's try and make it so they can just edit files, which is good, so people can use the editors they used to. We don't need the database, which is good, so because if you're using files, don't need the database. And we want to be able to write in whatever we want. We, it needs to be abstraction friendly. We want to be able to go, okay, I want to be able to do this crazy stuff, let's be able to do it, and it should assist us to do that rather than get in our way. So we ended up thinking about this. This was like a very long time ago. And you'll see it, it'll be like, whoa. Version 0.1. So prototyping with disenchant and some chats with this other guy. Uh, and we've come a long way. We've come a very long way. Um, now, it was developed, yeah, about two years ago when Noble was still 0.4, quite unstable. We had some interesting difficulties because NPM was still like 0. Point something version. It was quite, quite interesting. There was actually other things besides NPM at that time. Um, so, so at the beginning, all our plugins were actually bundled in the actual Docpad main repository because it wasn't a package manager. It was quite, um, quite funny. And then we moved to Git submodules, and then NPM became stable. So we started using NPM from then on. It's written in CoffeeScript. Um, how's everybody's feelings towards CoffeeScript? Are they open to it? Do they not know what it is? Anyone against it? I'll show you. I'll show you what's wrong. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, let's see. Coffee. I wonder how many this pops up. No, it's older. I have a great guess, which is. Nope, not that one. Here we go. This is from one of the early versions of Docpad before like, things like async was possible. That's the JavaScript for our generate function. So we remove the out path, we clean everything up, we pass the directory, our source directory, we generate all the relations, how the documents relate to each other, we render it, we write it. Now, when you forget a parenthesis here and it fails, it's pretty darn annoying. It is very annoying writing that in JavaScript. So. Moving to CoffeeScript, I don't have to worry about those damn parentheses. I don't have to worry about the semicolons. I don't have to worry about a lot of things. And the less I have to worry about, the better. Right? I don't like worrying. Except for the huh? Except for the indenting. The indenting. I use tabs. I don't have to worry about a little extra space somewhere. I. I yeah. That's, that's another rant you can get me started on. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so we've, we've got some coding standards for CoffeeScript as well if you want to check them out after the talk. Um, so it's all written in CoffeeScript. It's a lot nicer than this now because you know people figure out how to use promises in Node, which is a good step. Like now we can group things together and actually use good stuff. Um, so I'll probably give you a little rundown of how what it actually looks like. So, oh, for a little heads up, this website's generated with Docpad, um, which is pretty darn nifty. So, we'll get up a little thing, CD, make the test five, CD test five. So once you've installed it, just npm install, Docpad, whatever, inside your empty directory, Docpad run. And then, It'll be nice, it'll tell us which stuff do you want to use to get started with. We've got the boilerplate, Twitter bootstrap, kitchen sink, like a whole bunch of things people have already made, which is pretty nice. We'll probably go with a kitchen sink for this example, as that'll be pretty good. So what that'll do is that'll clone up the pre-made kitchen sink skeleton, get it started, install all our plugins that that website uses. Now. I'll one of the philosophies with Node is that everything should be as lightweight as possible. Pretty much, if it doesn't need to be in that module, make it its own damn module, right? So that way we can share as much as possible. And especially when Node was starting out, there really wasn't anything. So people could only write really basic stuff. And then eventually we chucked all that basic stuff together and we got something big, right? 
it worked quite well. So once that's done, cloned it out, installed the plugins, already got started, and I start up a little web server. So we go here, we'll be able to see it. We've got our new web startup with Node. And let's see what it looks like. Now, as I said earlier, we can render pretty much every single markup you throw at it. And we use a very like system to Rails, but considering no one here is a Rails developer except for you, then you probably won't know what that means. So what this will do, this is our source file. It will render from coffee, so CoffeeScript to HTML. Now generally CoffeeScript is only available for JavaScript, to JavaScript. However, some smart people who also like, who also hate things which have ending brackets, so for instance, HTML, head, and then, you know, I have to do the end head. I don't know why I ever have to do the end head, right? So people really hate doing these, and the people who hate doing that like Coffee Cup. Or Hamel as well does this type of thing as well, which is the less you have to write, the better. So this is a way of using CoffeeScript to actually write HTML, so that's the output there. So you actually have a function, you pass over the little callback, and then the callback will actually go inside. But the amazing thing about this is you can combine your actual code, your actual CoffeeScript code with the actual templating, which is really nice. Like previously, people would have been like, this is the worst idea ever. Why would you ever want to combine, combine code with your markup? But CoffeeScript is damn good looking. So I would say that's the first reason why anyone should do it, because otherwise you would end up with something horrible that nobody should probably use. So yeah, before it would have looked quite ugly. This is a fantastic tool, by the way. You can convert both ways. So I mean, no one wants to look, write a template that looks like this. But that's only one of the things we use. Where'd it go? Kitchen sink, getting started. There's coffee to JavaScript. Hamel to HTML. HTML, yeah, the other way around as well. Less, which is written in JavaScript, so that's quite good. Um, Markdown. Who here has used Markdown before? Good. A lot of people. You're, is it all because of GitHub? No. <laughs> okay. So for GitHub, if you use GitHub, they support Markdown for pretty much everything. Um, so when you do comments and things, you can do like headings like that, and you can do italics like that. It's really good for actually writing blog posts because you don't have to use a WYSIWYG, um, which is always going to constrain you. Um, you can ask me about that later. Um, and Stylus is another one for CSS. It's like less. Um, it's made by TJ Holloway Chuck, but it's a lot more flexible in that you don't have to pretty much use anything. You can even omit the braces and it supports variables and things like that. Um, so besides that, we can do some nifty things. If we actually want to, yeah, that's why it says nifties. So what, uh, I'll pop up the source for this so you guys can actually see what's going on. Where are we? Kitchen sink. So every docpad website is customizable, but by standard, they have your source directory. Inside here, we have documents, we have files, we have layouts. Anyone confused on what layouts is? No, that's real good. So documents are things we want to render. So for instance, here we want to render echo to HTML. Echo is created by 37 signals. It's coffee script inside your templates. So it's a lot more familiar to like say embedded Ruby. I'll probably have to be more specific. Where you can just be like, okay, Here's a little code snippet in CoffeeScript, do that. So it's quite similar to embedded Ruby. Now, all of this stuff will be, and files are stuff we don't want to render. Now, all of this will be compiled and sent into our out directory. So it actually generate a static website we can deploy anywhere. So index.html file says use the layout home. This is our stuff inside it. 
it wraps around the layout in this case default wraps around this we're using echo and here's our content that's where it gets wrapped around and we actually generate this file so we can deploy that to github pages apache whatever you want actually a good way to showcase this is here so we can actually go view this page source so that's the index page there now this is quite good because you don't need you can just write websites anywhere, deploy it. You don't actually have to deploy your website with Node, which is a lot of people are scared, oh, I have to host on a Node server, but you don't, which is helping its adoption quite a bit. Now, the nifty thing here is, actually, I'll, get, I'll show you. It'll be good. I'll walk you through it a bit. So we've covered the intro, which is, the problem with traditional web architectures. What's the benefit of Node? Installing. Now, we create a new website, install some plugins, get started. Now, this will. Do you guys want to see me live code this or just talk? I can live code if you want. Some people want to see live coding. That's good. All right. Can everybody read that, or is that too low? I don't, I don't know how I can... <laughs> I can zoom in like this, maybe. <laughs> yeah. All right. So what we'll do, we'll just start with an empty skeleton. And that will have generated our source directory for us, which is absolutely empty, I think. You can do no. Aww. Okay, so that's got that up. Zoom back out. So, let's get started. There we go, good. So there's, did everyone see that? Yep, you can see it, good. So let's start writing our thing. So HTML head. See, I I don't know why I have to do this much typing. I I will. We'll, we'll move on to it. Tough crowd. And we have to refresh. Now, let's get this going so we don't have to refresh. To do that, oh, to do that, we'll first have to make this. Let's move on to layouts first. That'll be more fun. So we'll want to start applying abstractions. <laughs> we'll turn this into a layout so we don't have to duplicate. Call that default. And we'll use Echo for this one. And because this is layout, we don't want to output our website. Instead, we what well, we do at the end. But we do want to output the actual document's title. For people unfamiliar with CoffeeScript, at is the exact same as this. And we want to escape that because that could you know, be something like five is greater than three, in which case it would be invalid. So escaping it will turn it into greater than, which is valid. However, here, we don't want to escape the content because we actually want that to be outputted as HTML. And we'll output the title as well, because we like titles. Oh, no one can read? All oh, right. So zoom. Anyone know how to increase the font in? Oh, I love sublime text. All right, title. Welcome. 
and <laughs> so that's our content, that's our metadata header. And we have to say what layout we want to use. We want to use default. All right. Cool. Well, that is big. Was that? That's. Tell me. Tell me when you guys can still read it. Okay. Was that joking or not? Okay. Is that good? I can still read things. All right. So, now that has happened, can anyone guess why? No? Come on, guesses? No. Because we don't have the templating engine installed, because we want to be lightweight. So, let's install Echo. I like it when people so get things right. Yeah, yeah. Fix it up all for us. We have to restart docpad because we installed a new thing. And there we go. So, now it's quite annoying having to, you know, always have to press refresh. Like if I say, hello, yay. See, it doesn't actually update. We have a plugin for that. We have a plugin for lots of things. So, get block. But to use the plugin, we have to be able to let our plugins add stuff into our DOM. And to do that, we use blocks. So, we've got a block for meta, we've got a block for styles, and we've got a block for scripts. So, what that'll do. See? Yeah, powered by Duckpad. That's the metal block being output. But we don't have any styles, we don't have any scripts yet. But Duckpad will also automatically regenerate everything. And it's it's damn fast. It is really fast. So let's install the live reload plugin. So we don't have to keep refreshing all the time. For anyone unfamiliar with socket IO um, let's the uh, browser communicate with the server side. Um, it uses web sockets if you've got a new browser, otherwise it falls back to like Ajax or a whole bunch of other polyfills you can use. So that's installed. Let's get Docpad back up and running. <coughs> All done. So let's go back to index. Hello. Smiley. Oh, I need to make sure that loads up with the smiley. <coughs> with live reload enabled. Ta-da! That is good. <coughs> and that's what our live reload plugin will insert. So it's pretty easy to use socket IE. You just include it, you open up a little channel to communicate with the server, and you reload whenever we send the regenerator request. We can take a look at that plugin. So plugins are originally, I like CoffeeScript, so this is some generated CoffeeScript. And oh, the CoffeeScript will be a lot nicer. But it's really easy to write a plugin. It's about, you know, the compiled stuff is less than 50 lines, which is quite good. So now we probably want to maybe migrate to something a little bit better than HTML. I was talking about Markdown before. So let's actually, let's do a blog post in Markdown. So what we'll do, we're upgrading now. We're upgrading from a little hello world to a blog, blog engine. So we'll say, what's the date? November 14th, 2012. What's the date? I'm, yeah. All right, and we'll say, load ninjas. And we'll want to use Markdown. So, title, no ninjas. Attacking city. Alrighty. 
So we've got that. Now, layout. Layout default. This is so cool. So we've got that, and it's there. Post. But we'll see, it would have already been generated here. It's already in our out, and it's here. So if we go out, oh, I've got too many tabs open. I can't see what I'm doing now. All right. I've got too many extensions as well. <laughs> okay, and whoops, that wasn't what I wanted. There we go. No extensions now. So we'll go post 2012, 11, 14, no interest. There we go. So that's rendered. But we want to start making use of Markdown. We want to be like, this is so cool and want that to become bold so we can actually you know not have to write ugly stuff but as you already know we don't have markdown installed so let's go install markdown now there's many different ways you can actually render markdown there's lots of libraries that do it so the one that's gained the most traction and is the most stable that we use is called marked Actually, I think no. We now have moved on to one called Robo Robot Skirt. I don't know why it's called that, but yeah. I kept typing Robo Trek originally, back from the Super Nintendo. It took me a fair while to condition myself. Whoops. There we go. So we've got this is cool now. We're now writing Markdown. Now, now we probably want to go do something. We probably want to be able to list our blog posts, right? Because if you can't list stuff, it's pretty boring. So we'll upgrade you to Echo, and we'll give you a little blog listing. So it'll be like, OK, Echo. Now, here, Where is my typo? Oh. And we also want to do that. Oh, okay. I'll explain this in a moment. There we go, and we've got our thing. Woohoo! Dun, dun, dun. Now that's pretty awesome. I think that's pretty awesome. Now, what does this do? This is a template helper. They're just functions we make available to your template data. You want to get everything in post. And this is where things get really, really nifty because <coughs> if we don't have a database, how do we query things? Can anyone guess? Yeah, because we've got the metadata, and how do we query the metadata if we don't have a database to query it with? What? You have to speak louder, I can't hear you. What was that? I said, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that is what we do. Um, but we do it. <coughs> in a pretty interesting way, which is we use this thing. Um, so Docpad is actually powered by Backbone.js. Whenever we, these files and everything like that, that's actually handled by Backbone.js. We pass that on to Backbone.js models. 
So, here's our source code. And we, this is why I like CoffeeScript, because we can actually give classes to JavaScript rather than having to write prototype, prototype, prototype all the time. It actually <coughs> makes it quite nice. So we extend our file model. I'll open up the file model so you can see. So we extend the backbone model. We define some properties. Here are attributes that we actually give the file. We've got a whole bunch of them. And we initialize everything. This is any stuff you would probably see in backbone. Now, when we query it, we actually use a project called Query Engine. So we add it all to a backbone collection, and Query Engine allows us to query that stuff in a way that is pretty much exactly the same as the MongoDB Query Engine. So who here has used MongoDB? Lots of people. Good. So you'll be quite familiar with this. So who here has used SQL? OK. They were more or less the same people. <laughs> <laughs> so which one do you prefer better? No, SQL. OK. So SQL, very old school, you write things in very long strings. So it's kind of like regular expressions of databases. <laughs> and no SQL came along. And I was like, why do we have to write such convoluted things? So I'm like, OK, let's just do find. We get a little stuff. And for this field, find everything where it is greater than this value. It's pretty straightforward. So I was like, OK, we've got an in-memory database. We, everything's in query engine, in a backbone collection. Let's create query engine. Let's get it up. And query engine runs on the browser. It runs on, the, on Node. It's used by Bugherd, which is a startup from Melbourne. They won 500 startups and got a whole bunch of money. It was really cool. Um, and they allow you to do like tracking on the actual like website. Like you can just like click log a bug there. It's pretty nifty. Um, yeah. So, okay, that's going to take us back to our. Thing. So, we'll look at what that looks like. This is our standard models. We've got an array of little JSON models. And right now, this is what we're doing. We're creating a, a query engine collection from it. We pass in the models. Feel free to say stop whenever you get confused. We find everything in it that has the tag jQuery. So we've seen we've got jQuery. We've got the tag jQuery here. And we return it as a JSON object rather than the actual backbone collection, which would be gigantic. Now, if we move on to the next thing, this is a different way of writing it. Instead, we set it as a query, and we add models later. Live collections allow, how can I explain this? So a normal collection, you query it. You get all the results back right then. Right? And then if data changes, you have to query everything again. Live collections will actually stay updated. So if one of our little things die, then it will refresh. It will make sure the data you have is always current. And that's very important for performance. Here we can start doing searching. So you actually do things like, OK, search for the string about in these things. So I could change that to something else. So I could be like, OK, search for history.js. And there must be something else that has his in here. His, there we go. So it allows pretty interesting searches. And then we have pills as well. This is another type of thing that we support. So peel is find everything with the ID index. So that's useful. I'll show you when it's useful. <coughs> it allows us to do things like this. For everything that has a tag node, well, it gives us a little pretty interface. And it broke in. Oh, no. Oh, no, it's not. I just don't know how to use it. Or well, maybe it is broken. I need to fix that. But it works because bug code uses it, which is good. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it gives us everything um, which we want. It's in Korean, in background collections, which is good. So when we actually do that little bit of code snippet, where was it? On our index page, get files at path, that actually translates
to ask doing an OR query on the relative path, which is where it is in relation to source, and as well a full path thing, so where it is in relation to the file system. And we support querying, sorting, paging in here. So for the blog post, naturally I would want things sorted newest first. To do that, where is it? Here. Actually, get files that path. I wonder if that actually does get files that. Oh, good. Path sorting, paging. I'm one step ahead of myself already. So if I want to do it that way, I can just do date, negative one. So get everything in the reverse format. And when I add something extra here, it'll do it for us. So, which will be quite nice. So if I add something else, let's say 2012, let's say 1225. Mary Xmas. Thank you. And we will see that back there. And that's the newest one because we sorted by date. Now, for those who don't believe me, I'll test whether or not I'm crazy or not. Sort in ascending order. Yeah, I'm not crazy. That's good. So that lets us do pretty, pretty powerful queries or like pretty powerful listings. We can use this on anything and we can extend this data with whatever we want so we can actually be like you know right and then we can we can do silly things all right which one was that okay that was the left side i hope it was the left side There we go, we just get that one. So we've got the power of a full querying engine, which is quite good, and yeah, that was good. It still just blows my mind how I can do that without actually having a normal database installed. Because the first problem I had when I told people about this idea was uh, you were like, you need a database to be able to query things. And I was like, I don't think you'd really need to. And they'll be like, shut up. No, you're blasphemous. All right, so let's move on to some more complicated examples. The kitchen sink, we can go back to that. Now, we don't always have to do just a static website. We can actually do things that refresh every single request. I'm too quick. Okay. So we'll go to Nifty's and dynamic content example. So this is an example of something that re renders on every single request. So we've got a random number and it changes every single time. How we do that is quite easy. We just say this is page is dynamic. Don't don't output it to the alpha portal, don't generate a static version of it, just re-render it every single request. And we'll get back the express.js request object so we can actually do things to it. So for instance, if we've got the name, then we'll actually say hello. See? So we'll be able to actually code proper web applications with this, not just your basic blog. Now, but static applications are really good for performance. Someone earlier here was saying they use it because they're stable as hell, there isn't security problems, and they're fast. They are really fast. So if we actually go and we bench how fast that page is, this little home page here, right? If that was Rails, how fast do you think it would be, or .NET? 
on your local laptop? How many requests a second? No guesses? On Rails? How fast? Few requests a second? Yeah. Depends on the laptop. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh oh. Oh, I'm in incognito mode. Okay. So let's find out. And hopefully, there's not going to be any proxy issues that prevents me from doing this. So Apache Bench, do a thousand requests and do one at a time, right? We can do more if we really wanted to, but when a request ends, it's going to power it off. Oh, and there's, there we go. So right here we get 900 requests a second on that page on my little 13 inch MacBook Air, which is good. So quite fast, on like some other times get between anywhere between like 1000 and 1800 requests a second, which is really good, really, really nice. So you put your little static website up somewhere, it's good. Even if you host it with Node, that's still good you're going to get real good performance and you get all the benefits of being able to use databases, being able to use whatever markup you want. Now, whoops, back to kitchen sink. Now because we just focus on one area which is rendering and parsing, you can add stuff on top of this. You can add your little CMS interface to modify things. For instance, I can make a plugin to use brackets, Adobe brackets, to get on that, which is good. Now, probably a good way to show you is just websites that are doing pretty nifty things. So for instance here, we regenerate this website every day. We just tell Docpad to regenerate every day. All of this documentation is pulled in whenever Docpad loads from a Git repository, keeps it up to date. So people can update this. This is just markdown files, and then we make it really nice and really good looking. So, I don't know, quick start. And it's rendered using highlight.js on the server side, which is another benefit using JavaScript, because all of those little JavaScript little widgets, you can get them running on Node, sometimes. <laughs> um, we do 404 pages, 500 pages if you need to. Now, we can. Has anyone seen a thing called Site? It was like a social CMS account. We got one odd head. Not a social CMS, a social blog. So it pulls in data from all these different places. And it's loading. That's the dude who did it. This is the way we would generally do it because doing it on the server side would be too difficult because we would hit that box, right? If we wanted to just on a little WordPress blog, I was just like, you know, hey, for a weekend project, I know nothing about WordPress. Let's actually go and pull in all my tweets. Let's go pull in all my Tumblr place. Let's pull in all GitHub. Yeah. You're going to be like heading for the window, right? <laughs> you're gonna to have to maybe call up some WordPress thing. And that's the same for any CMS. You're gonna to have to be skilled in the CMS, right? And it's gonna be slow. So what a lot of people do is they'll code up a lot of stuff on the client side. They'll be like, okay, let's move it to the client side. It's a lot easier to develop on the client side. There's Ajax and all that nifty stuff. But things are slow. See, it really, like this is static content. I mean, there's, there's, there's no reason why I would have to wait for every single time someone loads this website to fetch the exact same data. So if we want to be a bit more pragmatic about it, let's see what such a thing would look like. Hold up, I have to stop that one. In Docpad. Uh, I'm using an old plugin. Here it is. 
putting in Tumblr, there's my Twitter. So everything is already there because it's just talking to our web server. Or I think in this case, I actually just give it everything right away. So we don't actually have the loading problems. And it's actually pretty darn, darn easy to do because all we do is we say, pull in this feed. Oh no, wait, that's for our display. Pull in this feed, pull in this feed, pull in all our different feeds. And then in our side of stuff, that's in our layout. We just cycle through everything, render a little partial. We're using handlebars there. And we just render it. That's a little bit more complicated because we're doing a whole bunch of different services. But I'll show you a good example that you guys can probably go away. Who's got their own personal website here? Wow. So a lot of people of you, a lot of you will probably be getting a website tonight real easy. So if you're on GitHub, you know, you can set that up. You can brag about all your stuff. Well, not brag, but try and win clients. That's a better way of putting it. Um, and you get your projects. Pulled in from GitHub every single, I think, hour we regenerate this website. Everything's live. So, you know, that's actually the real watches. So I don't actually have to add that manually. I'll just pull that straight in from the GitHub Atom feed. And same with all this, putting in my GitHub stuff there, my Twitter activity, my Vimeo activity as well. And we'll take a look at what that looks like. So we've got our, there's our feeds. Pull in the BL Optum projects. There's our feed. Pull in our, so this is using the feeder plugin. Pull in GitHub, there, Twitter, there. And someone else in the previous talk, everyone was saying JSON, awesome, because everybody uses it. Good thing about JavaScript, we understand JSON natively. So feeder will put it in, whatever it is, and Let's go to our projects. This is coffee script. I mean coffee cup. So whenever we get a project, cycle through it all, like can cut the two arrays, and I'll put our project list. And our project list will be pretty pretty basic. We create a nav element, every single project, I'll put a little lie, a H3, things like that. Set their half. And this is great. I mean like that's just beautiful in my opinion because I get to say like project, hey, oh, it's, it's nice. And you know, when I want to do stuff, I just do if, right? So pretty good. Like I have all the power of coffee script. So that's easy. That like, that's literally, I just had to do 16 lines of template there and the two tiny little lines of actually adding the feed I want to pull in. And I get a website that pulls it in caches it because we generate a static website and re-updates it every hour. Pretty, pretty good. But let's move on to more advanced examples as well because we can do pretty nifty stuff. We, stuff like yes. I don't like GitHub pages. But there's a reason for this, which is right there. So the benefit of a static site is we can do dynamic things. We can define our own little routes. We could do this with a HD access file, but then you have to learn something else. Um, do all the different routes, our redirects. And we just do that through a server extend event. So go through the middlewares, which Darren was talking about before. So that's our server, use this middleware. If we're not using, or if we're using WW, get rid of it. And then <coughs> here's all our different routes, our specific routes our query engine magic here. So we can define posts, and then when we want to display all our posts, blog. No, here we go, blog. See, get collection posts, make that JSON instead, output everything, which is nice. Some site data I can pass. So like, if you want to translate your website, you can just have a different file for each like a different JSON file, a CSON file, if you want. And that's how we generate every hour. And we got different environment config. But as always, we can take it further. So if I want to get up the Beverly website locally,
Right now, the Beverly website is fetching all the contributors using feeder for all our different projects, so we can display that nice. Updating on documentation, generating things. And we've got lots of stuff in this site. It's quite, quite cool and quite big. But 13 seconds is a lot faster than the alternatives. And whenever we do a change from then on, it's good. But here's our authentication. Oh, and that's not working. I should have tested that before I talked about it. But yeah, you can log in with GitHub or whatever. That's using Passport for authentication. Um, now, it's good because that's experimental. It's not broken for everybody else because that's still under development. It's allowed to break. So, and that's, we just say, okay, when it's development, don't show it. Now, let's get that up and we'll see. Because before it took 11 seconds and that's not really acceptable. So, let's see how long it takes if we actually change that. It took 0 0.2 seconds to render because we do differential rendering from then on. The first render, we render everything after then, we just render what's changed. Which is why it really isn't that big of a problem. Now, that's, that will pretty much show you, I guess, what's possible. You can read more about it on the actual Beverly website. Like we've got the learning center and you can learn all about it and things like that. Oh, so this is the fetching of the contributors. That's all the contributors that's pulled in from GitHub and generated automatically, which is nice. Same with our project. Actually, no, on this website, they're, they're not. So that's quite good. So I'm open to questions now, but that was to showcase you what's possible, how you can get started with Node really quickly, and yeah, pretty much, yeah. That's pretty much it. But if you want to ask questions, now is a good time. So, yeah. 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 So. I understand TypeScript, I think it's doing a lot of nifty things. I understand how it can appeal to a lot of people. I don't think there is one thing that fits all. I've never been one of those people. That's why we support every single markup because I don't think there's ever one thing that fits all because then everyone would be exactly the same, right? TypeScript is good for you know stuff you want to be absolutely secure, right? You don't want to risk. There's kind of two camps. There's the developers who want to sit back and think and think and think and then code when they know it could work, right? Or there's a good percentage. Then there's the other ones which are more like, let's hack, let's hack, let's do things, let's get stuff, let's feel like the flow kind of thing. And they prefer things that can get stuff done real quick, right? And that enables that flow. So I think CoffeeScript enables that flow with a nice language. TypeScript is for the ones where you want to th think about things and you want to be real critical. We can support TypeScript in this if you want. It'll be like a 50-line plugin. But yeah, I, I think they both got a good future ahead of themselves. So yeah. Yeah. Deployment. Are you running, are you running a Jumpad run or a Jumpad server instance to run the Yep. So we s tree? Yeah. Good question. So what we do is we support environments. And that's how the Beverly website was able to turn off a lot of the experimental stuff. So at the bottom, if we're in development, let's enable the experimental routing and login and things like that. So what we'll do is Docpad has two things that can run. We have the normal Docpad client, so when you type Docpad, that's the normal one you use on development. It supports command line arguments and things like that. There's also docpad server, so just docpad dash server. That's what you'll run on the server. So we've got a little prop file. Who uses Heroku here? Good, a few people. So Heroku 
you mentioned a little thing on a prop file. That says we're running a web service and start up this little executable. So that'll start up docpad server and that'll run things in production, in the production environment. And there's some important differences because for instance the live reload plugin, that's great on development. You don't want sockets being created on production when you don't need them. So if you generate it on production or anything besides development, sockets will be turned off, like the live reload thing will be turned off, which is good. But deployment is pretty darn easy. Like, where is it? Deploy. Somewhere I'll see it. Deploy. So we create a little prop file. We specify our engines and our dependencies, so our plugins, and we say use the docpad server. Engines are important because if you're deploying on a web server that supports 0.6x and not the thing you want, you want to know about that. Otherwise, it could work, and then suddenly, like, your whole thing will crash and fail. You also want to specify NPM because there are lots of changes with NPM over time. And then you just push to the Git, the, the Git repo for Heroku and that'll set it up, install everything, get it running. It's real easy, like, yeah, real easy. If you wanted to pat deploy via Apache, generate the static website just like that and you can deploy it anyway. GitHub pages, here's some more info. Now, yeah, cool. Now, afterwards, you can, yeah, I, I'm happy to showcase how we do the unit tests, things like that, the plugin system, how we get over the asynchronous things. So like I know a few people are interested about that. So, cool, thank you. <laughs> and also, you can rate me as well on speaker rate so I can get more work. I don't know where it was. So if you like me, you can rate me. I'll put it up on the meetup meet up thing. That'll be easier. Cool. So yeah. Thanks, Ben. That was that was very informative. Um, cool. I'm definitely excited to check out Dr. Pat. Um, yeah. I just want to uh, thank um, uh, Ben and Darren again for presenting tonight. Um, some really interesting stuff in that uh, hopefully it's piqued your interest in Node and you want to keep finding more about it. Um, so, and this is, this is a good place to do it. Um, we'll be having another uh, meetup probably in about a month. Um, I think we aim for the second um, second Wednesday uh, in every month so far. Um, so hopefully uh, keep an eye on the meetup page. We'll uh, announce stuff there and when we've got some kind of repository for other stuff, um, we'll send an email out and, and let you all know what to keep an eye on. So again, um, thanks to our presenters and thanks everyone for coming tonight. Thank you.